call the meeting in order. Um, do the roll call. Yes, Allison Gould. Here. Um, Tom Bolster is not here yet. Um, Scott Holway. Here. Roger Lang. Here. Renee Davis. Here. Ken Houston. Here. Wes Lowry. Here. Kevin Bowden. Here. Jason Elkins. Here. Hope Bartlett. Here. Uh, Miles Churchill. Here. Chris Huffer. Here. And Kelly Mackey Tires here. Councilmember Martin is here. also here. Chair, you have quorum. Okay, thank you. Start with uh, last month's minutes. Any questions or comments on the uh, last minutes of our last meeting? Is there a motion to approve? That's a move. Okay, we we'll move and second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 No opposition. Mr. Chair, I didn't vote because I wasn't here last month, so just All right. for the records. Nice Thank to you. have you back. Thank you. Nice to be back. All right. Water status report. Kevin, you can do that? Yeah. Okay. Um, flow on the St. Rain lines this morning was uh, 8.3 CFS. The historical average, um, average was 83 CFS for this state. Uh, the call on the St. Rain Creek is Hill Reservoir. Uh, with a priority date of uh, June 2nd, 1882. The call on the main stem of the South Platte River is Pruitt, Pruitt Inlet Canal uh, with a priority date of uh, January uh, 13th, 1936. Uh, Ralph Price Reservoir at Mountain Mountain Preserve is at an elevation of 6390 or approximately 14,133 acre feet, mm -hmm. which is approximately uh, 2,064 acre feet. From full, that's 85%. Um, Union Reservoir was at an elevation of 22.9 feet or 9,266 acre feet, and that's down approximately 3,500 acre feet from full. Um, and we're releasing approximately 20 CFS out of the uh, Union Reservoir right now. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Move to approve. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Yes. Uh, is there any public tonight? We have a lot of public tonight, <laughs> I don't know if they're here to present. Are you all part of Dewberry? Yeah, we're the team. Yeah. Yes. All right. Dewberry should You're listening. <laughs> they're right presenting now. in a minute. Oh, okay. Okay. Um. All right. Let's start with. Uh, Upper North St. Rain Pipeline alignment, alignment study, Jason. Yes, sir. So, um, real quickly, um, I know I've talked about this in the past, but uh, we are now kind of finalizing um, this study here. And so, I've asked uh, uh, Dewberry and Schnabel, that's the team that we put together to evaluate different uh, alternatives and stuff for the upper pipeline, to come in and to present and uh, to add nothing else and credibility and some reassurance that uh, maybe we're. Uh, making some good choices here and stuff. And so the goal for today is to show you what it is that uh, we've evaluated and the options that we're, we're going to be presenting to city leadership, uh, knowing that these are tens of millions of dollar projects. And so really what we're looking for is, uh, you know, maybe if uh, anything else, just uh, some acceptance uh, with what uh, we've decided and uh, we can then move forward. And when we present it to city leadership, we'd like to say, you know, um, Water Board has viewed this and, and supports uh, this analysis. Okay. Having said that, I'll hand it over to Carl Bunchen with Dewberry and uh, Ed Wilson. Do you guys want to you can go ahead and use my chair that way you have to. Uh, what, whatever, whatever is easiest for you. Um, if you'd like to stand. Um, actually, Evan, if you want to sure. run, run, yeah. run the clicker. Yeah. Um, uh, again, I'm Carl Bunchen with Dewberry Engineers. Uh, we were asked by Jason about a year and a half ago to do an evaluation of the Upper North Pipeline system um, to look at different ways of getting the Longmont's water um, from Ralph Price Reservoir into the city. So this is kind of an overview of a lot of those different alternatives. Uh, team with us today, Evan Hoxson running the mouse, Chad Weaver down on the end. And then from Schnabel, we've got uh, Glenn Church, uh, and then both Marks right here. <laughs> <laughs> A little history on the um, 
the North Pipeline, if you guys haven't been up there. So it's basically located just downstream of Rail Price Reservoir. It takes water from the Longmont Reservoir and delivers it into um, uh, the two treatment plants, basically mainly Nelson Planters right now. Uh, a couple of the items that are the, uh, the sites that we'll be talking about, um, Longmont Reservoir, you can see here. The pipeline basically runs along um, kind of a pretty difficult terrain. Uh, it was originally installed in early 1900s, it was a concrete pipeline. That pipeline was replaced with a steel pipeline in the 40s. Um, it has been uh, maintained really since the 1940s all the way until now with uh, you know, various repairs over, over time. There is a, uh, uh, an area called the penstock where the water gets uh, pressurized as it goes downhill and then through the hydro facility to generate power. Downstream of the hydro facility is the North Pond. That's near um, Apple Valley Road. That's the difference actually between uh, the Upper North Pipeline and the Lower North Pipeline. Lower North Pipeline pretty much follows 36 out towards Nelson Planter. So a couple other areas that we will be talking about is, uh, you know, the North St. Brain follows 36. There's the former Lions Diversion. That Lions, city, city of Lions kind of like used to take water out of the St. Brain um, to supply the town. I don't know if anyone's been up there, uh, but it's pretty rugged terrain. You can see uh, somebody standing right here. The, the pipeline actually runs right along that shelf road that you can see when you're coming down from like Estes Park. Um, pretty narrow in some areas. This is about the narrow spot. It's only buried about a foot deep. In, in many spots, it's exposed. It's, it's, it's exposed to rockfall and to freezing. Um, it's, it's kind of served long on very well. Uh, for a long time, but it's uh, reached the end of its useful life. And we looked at a number of different um, alternatives to deliver uh, the city's water into town. Yeah, sure. So the purpose of this study, kind of as Carl alluded to, um, trying to come up with alternatives. Um, actually back in was it 2016, I think, um, Dewberry looked at replacement of the pipeline and its existing alignment. Um, and since uh, came out pretty infeasible to replace in its existing alignment, um, we're looking at just some other alternatives to get that same um, design flow of 28 CFS to the uh, lower North Pipeline system to um, eventually get to the treatment plants. Um, some of the goals um, or items that were made clear by the city was um, it was very um, beneficial for them. They saw at least um, the alternatives that could continue to generate electricity at the hydroelectric plant, um, you know, for both, um, you know, generating energy, but also uh, hitting their sustainability goals that they have in place um, for the near future. This is also a critical source of raw water, as Carl kind of said. Um, I believe it uh, supplies the majority of raw water for treatment and distribution for the city. Um, and it's reached its end of useful life um, nearing what, 80 something years old now since they put the steel in in 1940. Um, and due to the access difficulty and, and um, difficulty to repair and replace sections, um, we're looking at coming up with some alternatives. So the goal of this study was to develop alternatives to deliver 28 CFS to the North Pond or Lower North Pipeline system. Uh, working with the city, we came up with four kind of major Alternatives, um, the first being replacement of that existing Upper North Pipeline, um, utilizing the, the study back in 2016 where we were looking at replacing in the existing alignment for comparison's sake. We also came up with four alternative alignments. Um, those alignments deliver water from Longmont Reservoir where the existing pipeline starts um, to the top of the penstock that Carl was mentioning. Um, therefore, it would keep the hydroelectric facility in service. Um, second alternative we looked at was restoration and modification of the existing lines diversion structure, Carl pointed out, um, just off of Highway 36 along the North St. Green Creek. Um, we looked at two different um, capacities for that structure. One would be um, modifying or rehabilitating it so that um, you pull the existing design capacity that Lyons um, was using, which is roughly 6 CFS. Um, that could be used in addition to some of the other alternatives or for system redundancy flexibility. We also looked at um, modifying it for 28 CFS 
so that you can um, use that as a sole source for well water supply. Third major alternative we looked at was installation of a new diversion in the, in the North St. Brain Creek, and installation of a pumping station um, and a pipeline that would deliver water from that pumping station off the creek to the North Pond or tying directly into the North, um, the Lower North Pipeline system. There were three alternate locations that we looked at for that. Um, and then a final kind of um, alternative here was kind of similar to the first, but um, looking at slip lining the existing upper north pipeline. Um, this would reduce, and I'll kind of get into, but um, it would reduce the hydraulic capacity um, due to having you know, a smaller diameter pipeline and would require an additional supplemental delivery alternative in order to meet the full 20 CFS. So start by talking about um, replacement of the existing upper north pipeline. This is a uh, plan view figure here. The blue dashed um, line here illustrates the existing alignment um, in kind of that rough corridor that Carl was showing pictures of. This red line is our first alternative alignment. Um, we were you know, intending to utilize the existing Longmont Dam Road um, for ease of construction, ease of future access operations, um, repair or replacement activities. Due to the topography, um, roughly around, you know, this stretch right here would need to be tunneled in order to uh, maintain grade um, since it is a gravity system. And then eventually, um, as we're heading away from Longmont Reservoir, it'll cut back up. There's actually a little goalie here that um, the pipeline would be installed at and return back to its existing alignment. Um, downstream, this is actually much more accessible than the majority of the existing alignment upstream from there. There's an access road you could get equipment to and materials to. And then finally, we would terminate at the top of the existing headstock. Um, it, the hydro facility is located roughly right there. Second alternative alignment we looked at for uh, pipeline replacement um, actually utilized um, roughly the first half of the existing alignment. Um, and then cut down um, just downstream. I guess I should back up and mention there are two existing tunnels on the existing pipeline. Um, tunnel number one shown right here, tunnel number two shown right there. There's also an inverted siphon. Um, so for this, for this alternative alignment, we would be um, cutting down to Longmont Dam Road just downstream of tunnel number one, installing along Longmont Dam Road and then cutting back up in the same location as alternative number one. Alternative number three utilized even more of the existing um, alignment. Again, cut down just upstream of tunnel number two, installed along the road there, and cut back up to the existing alignment. The same location as alternative alignment number one and two. And then the fourth alternative alignment we looked at, um, very similar to alternative number one, installing along Longmont Dam Road, um, starting roughly at the reservoir there. Again, due to the topography of the road, number four, number one would require um, approximately 1,500 uh, foot long tunnel section. And then this alternative actually cuts back up to the existing alignment um, further upstream. It's a little bit shorter of pipe required. Um, but it's a bit of a steeper slope. And again, terminates at the top of the system. <coughs> uh, looking at slip lining the existing upper north pipeline, um, due to the, uh, you know, we have a, so the existing pipeline is 30 inch diameter. Um, we found that the maximum pipeline that we could feasibly uh, put into the existing pipeline would be roughly a 26 inch diameter DR17 HDPE. That would be fully structural. And that has a roughly 23 inch diameter um, inside diameter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. No, you're fine. Are we sharing the screen? <laughs> if you guys have questions while we're going through this, yeah. feel free to kind of got the whole team here or uh, 
questions from pumps to water right so certainly yeah um, so some of the issues we, we found with slip lining were there's minimal access points um, and due to the um, corridor, the very narrow corridor, inability to use any larger equipment that would typically be used to facilitate slip lining installation. So um, with those unknowns, it could make it more costly or not feasible to, to do that option. Um, it would also require an additional supplemental uh, delivery to meet the 28 CFS delivery goals, um, whether that be utilizing lines of diversion structure or um, the new diversion pumping station alternatives we discussed. Um, additionally, during construction of, of slip lining activities, the upper north pipeline would have to be taken offline, um, which would mean no flow delivery during that time. What kind of time are you talking about, no delivery? It would be weeks or oh, months, 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 months in order to install it, yeah. Or it'd have to be phased over a number of years to mm -hmm. do a short time. Do you need to? No. Okay. <laughs> Uh, moving on, um, sec kind of second uh, alternative we looked at, as I mentioned, was inst installation of a new diversion and pumping station along the North St. Brain Creek um, along Highway 36. Um, I'll show the locations here in just a second on the map. Um, and this would um, require a new pumping station, as I mentioned, and a new pipeline to tie into the um, Lower North Pipeline System or deliver to the North Pond where the Lower North Pipeline System begins. Um, this would bypass the existing hydroelectric facility. Not only that, it would actually require power generation, or um, it would take power to, to run that facility. So you're losing out on generating the power and you're uh, costing power in order to run that. Um, again, this could be used um, as a supplemental delivery um, in addition to one of the other alternatives, um, or for operational flexibility, system redundancy. These are the three sites um, that we located for a new diversion and pumping station. Um, site A is located just across the street from the North Pond. Um, that's where the hydroelectric facility is located and the lower North Pipeline starts. Site B is located um, just at the intersection of Highway 36 and Apple Valley Road, where the old Lions Water Treatment Facility is located, um, no longer in use, um, but utilizing um, that area. And the third location we looked at, um, down outside of Lions along Highway 66 at the existing Rough and Ready Bridge. Yes? So each one of these locations were required pumping? Yes. There were no locations that the topography of the board just no, not for the 28 CFS that we were looking at. This is a schematic of uh, what a pumping station at one of these locations could look like. Um, just for uh, reference, we got a little guy standing in there. Not the smallest facility, but um, you know, this is kind of a tentative schematic. Visual reference. And then this is what roughly a um, highlighted in red is kind of the infrastructure that we would plan to install. A diversion off the creek would um, lead into a pumping station building that would pump into a new pipeline, and that pipeline would convey flow. Um, in this circumstance, this is site B, um, a new pipeline along Apple Valley Road, and eventually we'll end up tying into the lower north pipeline system, um, or alternatively, it could uh, terminate the north. Uh, Lyme's diversion structure re rehabilitation, kind of third alternative we were looking at. Um, again, this is a this is actually the structure is pre it was previously owned by the town of Lyons. It's now owned by the city of Longmont. Um, the structure itself, as well as easements, uh, this structure as well as the access road um, were pretty uh, heavily damaged during the 2013 flood. The access road is almost non-existent. Um, we went out there to do a site visit, and it was pretty tricky to get there now. Um, the structure also has, still to this day, has um, branches and fallen trees and debris that's collected on it. Um, hasn't been used since then, but um, there is also an existing 14-inch ductile iron pipeline, um, which was previously used to convey the flow from the structure to the town of Lyons Water Treatment Facility. Um, it's kind of in an unknown condition after the flood. Um, 
it's exposed in a lot of areas, um, but we, we didn't see any um, any physical damage, but conditions came from there. Um, this alternative also would bypass the existing hydroelectric facility, would not generate energy like the um, pumping, uh, pumping station alternative, um, but it doesn't give you any energy generation. And it would require a new pipeline, uh, depending on the capacity, <clears throat> as I said, we looked at two kind of capacities. We could either tie into the end of this 14-inch ductile iron pipe at the old water treatment plant and install a new pipeline to North Pond for lower capacity, or for a full 28 CFS capacity, it would require a new pipeline installed from the lines to the structure all the way to the North Pond. Just to give you some visual pictures of what this structure looks like, I don't know how many of you have seen it uh, in person, driving along Highway 36. Um, as I had mentioned, fallen trees, sticks, debris, um, covering up the whole, all the gates are kind of damaged and broken. Luckily, the structure, the concrete structure itself is still um, actually very well intact and could be reused, if you found that, which is good. Um, so really it would be just replacement of gates um, and components like that. Here's another picture. This is that existing 14-inch ductile iron pipeline I was uh, mentioning. This is what conveys the flow, um, or used to convey flow from that structure to the Lions Water Treatment Facility. Again, exposed. Um, not sure if that was installed that way or if it was um, due to the flood, but currently exposed along the majority of its line. Uh, these are the two capacities, I uh, kind of already mentioned this, but um, we looked at 6 CFS, which was its existing capacity. Um, we also looked at 28. Um, we actually found that restor uh, restoring the structure for 28 CFS capacity um, could be done without you know, removal and replacement of the structure. We can use um, the structure itself and just replace um, gates to essentially increase the capacity of the existing structure increase the channel size. Um, so not a ton has to be done to, to modify it up from its current 6 CFS capacity to 28 CFS. Again, this is a site map showing the existing structure kind of highlighted in red there um, as it sits off Highway 36 um, along the North St. Graham Creek. We would also propose to install a slip meter on the downstream end for flow measurement. Um, but otherwise, a lot of that existing structure um, can be utilized. If there's anything else you guys want to mention? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. What's the fish passage like at that location? That's a good question. So I don't believe there there is no fish passage there. There is a small drop, though, right? Right. It does, it has a sloping bowler job there, so the water runs across that. It's, um, it might be faster than what the fish is going to look like. Yeah. When it was put in, I don't think it was designed so, like any yeah. fish passage criteria involved. Yeah, that probably does as well. I'm trying to remember, I feel like there was something on the same thing that they had funding for the, the particular structure. They, they put an application in and it was not granted. They focused on the fish passage funding was different this year. Good question. Yeah. Well, Allison, just real quick on the fish passage. We did put some funding in for next year in our CIP so okay. that if we do get some of that grant funding, we might match dollars to we could do that. And if we did the option like this, I mean it'd be a very small amount of additional funding needed to add like fish passage to it. So yeah. um, that's something that yeah we would take a, a, a better look at if we were to move forward with this design. Okay, great, thank you. Sorry, Tom's on now. So. Oh Are you with us? Uh, I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, oh, now I, now I can see the screen too. Super. Um, 
I don't have video from your side though. That's okay. We got the um, screen projected, so that's why you can't see us right now. Cool. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, and then um, just wanted to highlight what a new the new pipeline required um, for this line subversion structure. Again, the existing 14 inch diameter ductile iron pipeline terminates uh, near Apple Valley Road at the old water, uh, Lines Water Treatment Facility. So regardless, a new pipeline would need to be installed to tie into the lower north pipeline system. Um, you know, size dependent on the capacity. Um, for the full 28 CFS, we would require a new, um, a new 30 inch diameter pipeline all the way from the structure. To, um, so I guess a, a point that you made before about uh, pumping, um, you, we would have to take water from about that location upstream in order for us to not have to pump. Yeah. So from the Lions Diversion, we can get water to the North Pond, and then everything downstream of that runs as it always has been. Downstream of that would require a station. Okay. So were there any locations upstream of that that were considered? Were that A, B, or C? Uh, we considered the, the uh, pipeline alternative routes and then um, I guess two different configurations for the terminal, right? 6 CFS and 28 CFS. So. But we didn't look at any other um, locations. Yeah. yeah, the rest of the sites we looked at downstream, um, yeah, would be, would, be, would be pumping. So we didn't look at any other gravity fed solutions since this structure already exists. In yeah. That's your question. Thank you. Yeah. I uh, just wanted to highlight some costs, um, specifically this is for the replacement of the Upper North Pipeline. Um, these are um, desktop level uh, study costs, just wanted to uh, point that out. So really these were just used mainly for comparison between alternatives um, as opposed to for the design cost of um, Again, this is the, well, maybe I can back up. Well, I don't know if you saw the, is there possible to go through? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the replacement in the existing alignment, um, we cost it out to be roughly $37 million. Um, as you can see, the alternative alignments we listed, um, some of them being you know, roughly $10 million cheaper. Um, one of them that utilized a lot of the existing alignment is fairly similar to the uh, existing alignment. Just wanted to show kind of the differences in costs there. And then slip lining, um, roughly, you know, again, that, that number could go up or not even be feasible at all, depending on the constructability, but that's the same number of And let me to point out that that slip line cost really doesn't deliver your full 28 CFS. Yeah. Yes, it's a reduced cost because of the smaller package. So at some point, do you look at those alternatives as far as pros and cons, and the preferable choice? I mean, are you going to come to I mean, cost is one thing, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll go over the costs and then we'll dive into the decision-making kind of over the All right. story. This is looking at the uh, new diversion and pumping station, um, just again for rough, just to put it in your head, kind of the rough numbers there for this alternative, sitting around five to $10 million. Rehabilitation of the existing lines diversion structure, um, restoring for six CFS capacity, would be roughly six and a half. Um, as you can see, restoring for 28 doesn't, uh, in the grand scheme of things, is relatively similar in price. Um, these prices do include a, uh, a new, uh, sorry, they include the required pipeline for those capacities as well as access road improvements. One thing to point out is if, if the structure is not intended to be used and, and um, abandonment is necessary, um, there is a price for that as well. Why is that? Why is the abandonment? Why is there a cost <laughs> for abandoning the structure? What? Well, yeah, we ended up just having that in there. Just to, I, I think, Jason, did we dis determine that if we were to, to not use that, eventually the city would have to remove it? That's was yeah one of our one of our options and so just uh so it's not just sitting there uh, degrading over time 
would rip it out. And the big thing is trying to get to access. The access no, is the problem. It's just curious. I mean, if they didn't do anything with it, it would still be there for a <laughs> yeah. year. Yeah, it would. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so outside of cost, um, some other qualitative factors um, that we were using to come up with a recommendation um, and analyze these alternatives. Um, number of items here I'll kind of quickly go over was water rights impacts, um, water quality impacts. This is mainly um, pertaining to if you were to take water um, downstream in the North St. Bernard Creek. Uh, I think there was a study that came out that you know, almost yearly there's a trucker spill along Highway 36 that could uh, dump stuff into the water you don't want for your drinking water. So um, but further downstream, we kind of viewed that as more likely that something like that could happen. Energy usage, um, that pertained both to um, the hydroelectric facility, whether, whether or not that was um, remained in place, as well as for the pump station alternative they're actually using. Property ownership impacts, um, natural disaster resiliency, whether it be rock falls for the pipeline or flooding, as we saw in 2013. Environmental sustainability, life cycle, ease of operation, system shutdown requirements during construction, all necessary permitting, easement acquisitions, as well as the sustainability evaluation system scoring. So we met with um, some folks in the city of Long Island. And that was like LPC, the sustainability team, uh, engineering, like basically any any internal stakeholder of, of, of you know the North Pipeline. We met with them and did that SES evaluation, which we're supposed to do now on um, all major capital projects. And so we went through all that. We're looking at you know the feasibility of doing this project from an environmental standpoint, taking the dollars out of it and just looking at what's the impact to the environment. And so everything that they're doing now, we did again, just from an environmental standpoint, redid a scoring matrix and kind of came up with preferred options and stuff based on that. And then we took that, what the, the results from that and included it in, uh, in our decision matrix here. So it is, you know, the environmental aspect of that is captured correctly in this uh, study. Jason, do you, I'm sorry, no, okay. um, do, uh, does the permitting, um, do any of the alternatives or all the alternatives or some of them implicate a 1041 within Boulder County as well? I uh, think every single one of them, yeah. except for maybe the pump station, you know, but the ones where you're gonna have to put a pipeline that doesn't exist on Apple yeah. Valley Road that's over eight inches, yeah. it automatically triggers a 1041. Yeah, go ahead. Follow-up question on permitting and then also on in channel flow, um, is a 404 during the crossings completed? If we hit crossings, uh, yeah, unless yeah, we board, we would have to uh, have a port. But I'm trying to think, uh, I'm trying to think now which one of the pump stations would we actually have a crossing? I don't believe we would have a crossing. The crossings associated with pump stations now. Uh, not necessarily the pump station, but the pipeline. Yeah, that where we crossed the north, like right we outside the long line as well. Yeah, we would have two crossings there. Yeah, so the pipeline alternatives would have a four yeah. four, the pump stations would not. Yeah. Okay, so that was part of the permitting mm -hmm. process. Okay, and then follow up on the uh, in channel flow. I understand the idea of like the higher up you take it, the less likely you are to get crowded in the stream and mm -hmm. get that in the intake. On the flip side of that, that is a location that my understanding is that's pretty low flow um, and also has some temperature issues. So the more that you're actually able to maintain flow in the actual natural channel, that yes. should be an environmental benefit. Yes. Was that in yes. balance? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So the both the pump station and the lines of conversion structure, since they are taking directly from um, that North St. Green Creek, I think we rated them um, worse. Well, so, but it was uh, like, so you're meaning if we can carry the, the flow down the stream, oh, yeah, 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 yeah,
pumping power. So I mean, yeah. even having in-stream flows, Billy, when you look at the decision matrix, even in SES, it really could, it wasn't enough to overcome. Um, it wasn't enough benefit just from the in-stream flow alone. So yeah. I think you'll see that, I think the pump stations were probably the last alternative that we would come up to. Okay. Thank you, that's really helpful. And I don't remember the capacity of the pen stock, but I feel like it was lower than 28 CFS, wasn't it? it the actual design, yeah. Uh, We've always used 28, but 28 I remember someone was bringing that up. Three, I think, but when the city is running, it's been 24, I think, is yeah, we can mass. We can hit 28 CFS through there. We've, we, did a, a, we did a flow test and opened, opened the valve wide open at Nelson Flanders, we were able to hit a little over, I think, like 28.2 or something like that. So it's, we don't operate it 100% like that. Um, we don't like to do it quite you know, wide open, but uh, we did do that just to make sure um, that we could hit that mark if we were able to. And there's always lower availability to get all the way up to 28? Um, no, I mean, like, especially in the winter time, you'd be sweeping the river at that point, and we don't, we don't do that. So, um, you know, we leave enough going over on that dam so that there is in stream flows, and um, we do have it as a priority to in our CIP to restart the in stream flow program, which um, uh, I think you know, we had mentioned that uh, in six months or so ago about uh, the top possibility of doing that. So, we're that's something that we're looking to uh, starting next year. Great. What about your demands? Do you have demands that? That require that? That require? 28 CFS. Uh, yeah, in the summertime, absolutely. But we, we don't, the with our CBT that we get from, from Northern, we um, the plan operators use combination. So I think what we hit, 30, 30 MGD is something like that, maybe even a little, is that right? Um, yeah, in the, in the summertime. So it takes a, um, multiple sources and so yeah so the north line uh, we try to run that year round I mean that's correct me if I'm wrong we've never shut that down for anything other than maintenance we've never had to you know we've never had to shut it down because of water quality because of an incident uh, other than you know, the flood but you know barring that uh, you know, the north line we run that year round um, and yeah they, they throttle that and stuff and they make up the difference with, with CBT and now that we get the south line um, is now up and running. We can actually take deliveries from the south, uh, the south side Ring Creek. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Ken and I were just talking about this earlier. It's like, well, why don't we just take all the water and just flow it to the Highland Ditch and just divert it there? And um, it sounds really easy, but for one, we don't have the carrying capacity, so we'd have to renegotiate that. For two, you know, when the ditch isn't in, in operation, we'd have to fill the ditch up and then. Um, our diversion off of the Highland Ditch is meant to take in 28 CFS. So, um, and then the loss of water rights from you know having to go to the water court and take everything from Longmont Dam and bringing it down. Even that, I mean, it's like it's right there. You can literally just take water straight to the plant without having to do all this. And even then, we can't we can't justify going and doing that. So, we're looking at 30, 40 million dollar options. <laughs> That makes sense. And just one final question, and I'm really glad to hear that the discussion is going in terms of maintaining some of the flow, especially it's winter time, isn't that the worst? Is that any current issue? Is there, is bypass, especially in like cold temperatures, being considered as a part of the intake design on top of the pipeline? It have to occur because of the water any time of the year. It, can it bypass? Yeah, it can bypass any of that. Okay. So taking these qualitative factors here we listed, plus the cost, um, we came up with a scoring matrix. Um, I don't know here, but hopefully you guys can see that. Um, really what we did was each of these rows here presents a alternative or sub-alternative. So we've got the uh, replacement of the pipeline and its existing alignment, alternative one, two, three, four for the uh, different alignments we came up with, lines diversion structure, uh, various capacities, New diversion pumping stations, slip lining, and then we looked at the um, both cost and those other components that we looked at. And really, what we did was we um, came up with a score for each of these alternatives and each of these factors um, between one and five. Five being more favorable and one being less favorable. And that way, we were able to directly compare um, these alternatives to one another, not just looking at the uh, the cost number. 
So kind of over on the right, the higher the total score, the more favorable that alternative came out. Um, the, highest, um, the highest score was actually a tie between replacement of uh, the existing North Pipeline and alternative alignment number one, um, and alternative number four. Those were the alignments that went along Longmont Dam Road. Um, and then, as you can see, as Jason noted, I'm trying to look here, yeah, the lowest scoring ones were easily the pump station options. Um, all three of those ranked very low. So, um, so based on that, um, kind of just wanted to show you again, this is what those alternative alignments looked like, um, in case you forgot that they were running along Long Island Dan Road. So our recommendations would be um, in the near term um, to rehabilitate that existing lines diversion structure and modify it for 28 CFS um, due to its relative low cost compared to other alternatives. However, since this does um, have some other qualitative um, issues uh, about it that make it worse compared to the pipeline alternative, um, we feel having this in place would allow for full system redundancy in case something to the pipeline happens. Um, also allows for operational flexibility. And then in the long term, um, recommend replacing the existing upper north pipeline with a new pipeline, utilizing either alternative uh, number one or alternative number four, and that could be staged over um, years. Another good thing is if the uh, line diversion structure is in place and you're removing or replacing, replacing sections of that existing pipeline, um, you still have your full design for there. So. And that was all for the presentation. Now, back to the yeah. near term and mm -hmm. sort of back. Yeah, sorry. So, uh, the cost associated with the near term, what was that number again? Uh, six and a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. We could go back maybe like four. Uh, yep, right there. Uh, sorry, seven point one million. Let's see, I guess. And then the near term. How long is the near term? Before you have to get into a long term situation. Does anybody see a sense of that? You know, the upper north pipeline nearing the end of its useful life it continued it continues to spring leaks now and then it it will um, i guess continue to cost the city money on repair until finally there is some some failure at some point um, in which case it's going to be an emergency and the city will be out of water for a bit it's hard to really say you know this is going to happen then because there will there could be some large rain event and, and rocks come down <clears throat> and washes it out but um, you know, it, it, I think we ballparked it that that line probably, you know, 10, 15 years. It's probably died. It's continuing getting thinner and thinner and springing leaks on it. Um, but we had 10 or 15 years, and then it's just going to be patching all the time in order to really um, keep that existing north line in service. I guess what I'm saying, I mean, does it make sense to even consider the near term and just go with the long term? Solution. I mean, it, it, that's just kind of temporary. The near term, right? It's temporary. It also, I mean, like I said, it does provide an additional source um, for operational flexibility. So if you had the pipeline and this something had rock fall in the pipeline, you have to shut it down. You still have the ability to flow. Um, we were also thinking if you to construct the north pipeline was gonna, going to be, you know, probably it could take a couple of years, depending if you have to phase it. So having another source that's relatively high upstream and still can deliver water would be kind of the backup for um, when the North Line. So the redundancy is, is mm -hmm. there's a value on that, obviously. Mm -hmm. And we haven't presented this to city leadership yet or city council. Their take on it might be the same as yours. Hey, we like we like how your where your mind's at and everything, but. Let's just bite the bullet and fix it now. And having said that, I hope with lack of funding and stuff, and especially with you know having a hard time even just getting Nelson Flanders plan expansion, you know, fun, uh, to a fully funded status and get that constructed. Uh, if I was making a guess, you know, it would be fix the lines diversion structure over the next five to ten years. We can we can afford to do that. And while you're doing that, 
we'll have to start thinking strategically, how are we going to actually fund another $30 million project? And just out of curiosity, now that the, you mentioned the, the plant that you know, we've got plans up there to rehabilitate or expand that, is that kind of on hold right now, or, or what is the situation? It's just a money problem that we don't have it, or? You got an update on that? Yeah. I, Chris Huffer, uh, new at the table, uh, um, uh, but uh, operations and uh, engineering is working on that plan for Nelson Flanders. Uh, it seems like every time we go out and talk about something, it goes up another 10 or $15 million. But, um, million, is it? What? Million. Yes, million. <laughs> We're not, we're not going to be the... <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the, the current plan that is uh, getting put into the current CIP, uh, for the next five year CIP uh, process, is basically to, uh, we've identified some uh, resiliency projects to do at the existing plant. So that's about five to seven million dollars worth of work in the next two years. Um, and then the uh, Montgomery tank, which is uh, right at the plant here on Highway 66, the 8 million, uh, 8 million gallon tank uh, needs to be refurbished. Um, so that would be the second phase of that work. Um, and then there is uh, site work that needs to be done, uh, redundant floor bank, uh, which would be a uh, third phase, uh, plus some piping on the site, and then the actual uh, expansion of the treatment plant itself will be out in the fifth, fifth and sixth year. A project that started at 30 to 40 million dollars is now up to 97 million dollars for all of that scope. So, um, so we're spreading it out, uh, we're looking for different ways to fund it um, and also keep redundancy. Uh, one thing to keep in mind though is that our demand has um, stayed relatively flat uh, over time as we've increased in population. Um, so it's not necessarily a need for uh, additional capacity at this point in time, but more for redundancy. As we gas is uh, getting older and older, as we mothballed for a little while, we have not had to turn it online. Uh, but uh, uh, it makes people in the water a little nervous just to have one source of water. So um, the more we can make muscle planners redundant, the better off. Answer question. Yeah, you're just trying to you know prioritize all this, which comes first. Uh, I mean, and the other thing, I'm just kind of curious. So this, the payment of all this uh, are these rate increases? Is that really how we pay for this stuff, or or what? What is the payment plan? Those are things that we're looking at as well. Um, obviously, rates. Play a big part of it. Uh, there are uh, state revolving funds that uh, we can apply for. Uh, there's options for some grants uh, that we're pursuing. Uh, so we're trying to find every penny that we can. That we can. Nelson Flanders was a bond initiative. Oh, oh yes, that's true. Uh, yeah. So we, 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 have sold, bond. we sold bonds for that, but then when we went out for construction, that wasn't enough. Yeah, to step back to that phase approach, the, the bonding was intended to cover all of the project. Uh, it will now cover the two-year phase one uh, redundancy plus the Montgomery tank. I don't want to complicate by getting off this subject, but I, I, I guess really my sense is we're, we're debating near-term versus far-term, and that's kind of the two balls we're trying to juggle. Tom, you got any? Comments at this point. Uh, no, um, I'm, I, I mean I have the same same types of thoughts that you're having about just I mean it's the same type of budgeting type analysis that you do in your own personal life as well, right? Like that patch patch it or or buy new, I suppose. So, um, uh, but anyway, yeah, I mean I'm following along with the discussion here, but but I don't have anything to add. Um, I like the idea of the operational flexibility and see it as less of a short-term solution and more of just a 
versatility. I think it accomplishes a couple of things. One, you can actually divert the same water right downstream or retain the water right, but you can also have the benefit of the in-stream flow up above that. Um, there's opportunities for funding there. You can see the BCD potential. Um, then also, if you have like some sort of catastrophic event, and you can put the hydro power plant down or converge the rock slide, and the pipeline can wash up, then you could also sort of divert the same water and then also direct construction. So it seems to me that even though it's it, it's less of a medium term patch and more of a longer term investment in system flexibility and redundancy. Okay, so are you saying you like the long term? I like the plan of doing the two of them. Well, what are you going to Scott? Well, because I don't get to vote on how we fund this other than as a taxpayer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so you'll be there, I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, no, I don't think conceptually, I think Alice is correct. I think that that, that's the most sensible long term plan. I'm just not going to be an 80 year old pipeline in some functions, right? I mean, it's, that's pretty cool, but it's also a little scary. Um, we don't factor in any years for most of our projects that we're working on for duration, so good, good for us. But uh, we know that I think we, we have, I, I think that we should be looking at a short term and a long term in combination because it buys us a better, more resilient system for the next few years than doing just one or just doing the other. Um, but I don't think we're going to pull out funding, so I think we cost a little bit beyond anybody's imagination. Right. Likewise, it's nifty. We've got an 80 year old pipeline. It's, it's nifty. It's terrifying. It's, terrifying. it's both, both, both those things. Yeah. And so, you know, it is due for replacement. Redundancy is always neat. And I think exactly your point. Redundancy is great, but can we afford it? Um, you know, so there is, and it's it's hard to it's hard to always make those decisions separate from costs because that's the reality. Um, and I, I know we have costs, so that's helpful. But you know, how do we actually fund it? And what does the funding do to the timing of it? Those are also because it would be a bummer to have a ninety-year-old pipeline. <laughs> It'd be nifty and terrifying, but more terrifying than nifty. Well, I mean, I, this isn't my expertise either, but you know, the, the population has um, participated in funding our water supply at a higher cost because that was necessary and critical. The supply is useless if it can't be delivered. I mean, there's, there's a secondary component to that that's not as sexy as my language. But without pipes and pumps, the extra water we get from uh, Windy Gap isn't very valuable. So, Although that would be delivered through CBT systems. Maybe. Correct. Not the current problem. That's true. Um, yeah. But I do think but, that, that I actually trust our public a lot. I think they do understand to your point. Yeah. They're fine funding water. And I think when you say, and we need to get the water there, they're like, yes, of course. So I think people do understand water equals pipes and piping alternatives. Well, it sounds like both plans are kind of in play now. From a timing standpoint, if we say, yeah, we don't want the long range all by itself, we'll start with the near term. What would the timing, I mean, would you start with the near term and leave the long term for a period of time? Is that, is that what your thoughts are? Yeah, um, I mean, I would think you could probably move pretty quick on um, the near term work. I mean, having a design to upgrade the, um, uh, the lines, diversions, year, year and a half, you could probably construct that in another year. Um, Long term, you know, that the pipeline would require a little bit of um, effort just from a constructability standpoint because you're not going to do that in one year. It's four and a half miles, <clears throat> uh, pretty intimidating terrain. Um, we've worked all over in the mountains in Colorado, and to date, this is the most challenging pipeline I've ever seen in the last 30 mountains. Uh, <laughs> it's not very narrow. Um, I can see this taking a uh, uh, a couple of years just to build. Um, I mean, you're talking near term right now. Uh, no, well, uh, I should say the, the North Pipeline and its existing place. I think the lines diversion, that one has a pipeline that would have to be uh, built as well. That one could get done pretty quick and pretty easily. You know, the longest thing on that would just be permitting. Um, 
Belfair North Pipeline has you know, constructability issues and permitting issues. Um, the uh, lost my train of thought. <laughs> there was something on uh, constructability. Uh, oh, it'll come to me. I don't know if that well, answers. Let me ask that. So, if we like the redemption team to say start with the near term, the long term we just set aside for the near term. Near term is done, and we'll see where we're going to. I mean, we take that bite first, do the other on the shelf. And then decide when to start the other down the road. I mean, that's kind of how it all works out. Yeah, and, and uh, so I guess uh, uh, what you said there clicked again. Uh, so one of the things you wouldn't have to monitor. So the, the, the pipe generally, unless there is some catastrophic event like uh, could have a, you know, another flood, um, a fire with a subsequent flood afterwards, that would likely be what takes out the, the North Pipeline. It survived the, the 2013 floods um, pretty well. The um, in, in most steel pipes, the, their mode of failure is going to be corrosion and pinhole leaks. So it's it's catching. It's not going to like blow up because of too much pressure because it's getting too old. It's, it's a, a gravity most of the ways until you get to those uh, that inverted siphon, which is just the pipe gets pressurized and comes back up, and that's actually where a lot of the issues were. The city's done quite a bit of work in, in those areas to harden those, but it's still exposed. Most of the pipes above ground, people could shoot at it. Kids could go out there and beat away on it. Um, you know, rock fall, rocks have come down and landed on it. Um, so things could happen to that pipeline, but um, you know, it, it takes a while to get a pipeline of this length, both you know, permitted fabricated and installed so there is a window there that you will have to start thinking about maybe of five years between go and we need something to deliver um, so, so you could do the near term in a five year period is that kind of, oh, I, I, think I, I think yeah the near term could easily get done in less than five years and then maybe you've got 10 years before something needs to get done it sounds like for Kind of on the same page. And Roger, to maybe make a little bit more information. So the, the three main hazards that we see up there at the up north line is a slope washout, which we already have, um, failing uh, timber cribbing, um, and then um, geohazard uh, issues. Big rocks the size of cars and houses falling on our pipeline, which do exist, which are up there. So um, the direction we've been given from our former deputy city manager, Dale Radimek, who was, let's get another 10 to 20 years out of this. So start priority projects. So right now we do have about two to $4 million funded over the next five years for access improvements, uh, to fix the slope washout, prevent any future washout um, that's currently happening, uh, to replace the uh, failed timber cribbing, stuff like that, so that we can get another 10, 20 years out of it. Um, some of the exposed pipeline that's, um, that he's talking about, you know, that's uh, corroding and failing. Uh, let's fix that. So we've got funding in place. We're working on that to try to, you know, make another, make it, you know, instead of 90 years, maybe a 100 year pipeline um, so that we have plenty of time to figure out what are we going to do for the long term and how are we going to fund it. And if it is something that's going to take, you know, five to 10 years to fund, um, then we don't. Hopefully, our, our risk is minimized so that we can get uh, we can we can get that without a major failure. Um, I think the the short term one is something that we can absorb within our, our our next rate study and get that done over the next you know five to seven years while we figure out how are we going to do the long term. Are we going to do an, are we going to sell more bonds? Are we going to uh, try to use the revolving fund? I don't think we typically use the revolving fund because we get a better rate on our bond. We have a better uh, bond rates. So we get um, Lower lower rate that way than through the, the state revolving fund, but maybe maybe this is something that you know we look at you know maybe part of it is absorbed into the rate study, uh, so you know so the utility rates pay for a portion of it while we sell some bonds for the other. But that's that's why we got to get this in front of the city leadership and get their support and get in front of the council and get guidance from all of them to figure out how do we want to do this. So you're looking for a position from us. If you 
you support our recommendations and <laughs> we can take that to leadership and council and saying that water boards reviewed this and supported it, that would be great. Anyone want to make a stab at uh, our position? Some form of promotion, some takeaway from how we feel about it. So. I only have a question. I don't keep carry these numbers in my head, but we've had a lot of utility rate impacts over the last four years. And I would not, in, in your position, make a recommendation without reviewing what those are. I'll say that again, Mark. Where are you? I said we've had a lot of utility rate, not, not just water, but in terms of what the city rate payers are paying, right. um, all pretty necessary. Um, I, if you're if you're looking at alternatives that spread farther or, or pull in closer, and, and, and as opposed to risk, which is what I'm assuming you're doing, um, you also want to look at the current burden on the rate payers um, because there's not a huge amount of slack in there. I kind of think that's where we are, though, in near term, pushing the long term down the road. Yeah, you know I'm not I mean? saying which I, way you go. I'm just yeah, saying but I way. mean, given that, I think that would be the most uh, less burdening cost-wise on the ratepayers by doing it that way. We're told if that gets the job done that we need to get done, we're told the electric rates will go down in seven years. Huh? Great. But the study is also not suggesting how we fund this correct like that. Uh, yeah, we're I, simply I, just yeah, saying that's another the, these, are, these are the you know these are some solutions and these are what we kind of recommend. Here's some dollar values. It's you know, we're not yeah, we're not proposing any type of. You know, I think all we're saying operationally, what do you think is the right move to make given what you presented to us? So again, I'm asking. So we want to add something. Just say that. Go ahead. I would be happy to make a motion. I wish you would. Oh, I would. Um, uh, funding aside, and uh, with the understanding that this is not taking into consideration how this would potentially be paid for, but that is always a consideration that we should keep in mind. The analysis that has been presented by staff as well as Super and Chapel makes sense to me. Um, I think that it is taking into consideration a litany of factors. Um, those that are both close to my heart in terms of industry and flow, and others that I would never even contemplate. So I'd like to commend staff for a really great job, and I personally think the analysis makes sense, and I would move that be supported. I would second that motion. You get all that, Heather? No. <laughs> 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 I didn't think so. Is that what the motion is? Yeah, it makes sense to me. And funding is a separate issue. Yeah, I think that's do the near term and look at the long term down the road. Now that is different from what I understood Allison to say, because I heard her say concurrently to look at both of them together. But operationally, are you saying? You would effectively do work on the long term while you're doing work on the near term? I would defer to the professionals to undertake that. Um, it, it sounds to me like the longer term has got a lot more that goes into it. So even though you may want the long term to happen immediately, the short term is actually the one that's functionally more than we're going to implement. Right. So I think it's by default near term. Um, but I would support, as the other, I think you, you understand me correctly, I would support the dual outcome that was proposed. So we're doing something in the short term, but we're also looking at the long term concurrently. Right. I guess what I'm trying to gather is if we're going to say, okay, we're going to do some work on this. The work initially is in the near term, and the long term comes down the road, I think you said. I think so. I'm not trying to complicate okay. it, but... There was a slide that you guys had. Mm -hmm. That was like, I don't know which one it was. I'm talking about. There was, it said near term. Near -term. I think that's the one where both Roger and I are fixated on. Sure. 
Doesn't have a time. But timing wise, long to the short term numbers, yes. from the time it's in, is determining on when, how long we last on the long term. That would come after that. So. But, but I don't think they need to be linear, Roger. And I don't think they, they, they probably can be linear. Um, if, if you're talking about a near term project that may take up to five years to implement, and you have a lifespan on a 80 year old pipe that we're hoping to get 10 to 20 years on. I think you have to start working on the long term somewhat concurrently, albeit not with a total cost all in. You know, here's the entire amount, you know, in, in, in that intro. You have to be doing some planning, you have to be doing some potentially design work. So I think that does go concurrently, unless there's a cash flow issue, which you got above our pay rate. Okay. Okay. Um, so I don't think it's linear. I think there's some overlap, but it's certainly the focus is on a near term plan, the focus is on creating a near term temporary solution. And as we start into that, we have to consider as a city how we get to the long-term plan because it has a longer planning period before it begins to be implemented. So that has to overlap, I think. Maybe, maybe that's my misunderstanding. Well, that's the way I heard it. That's the way I heard it. All right. All right. So. Yes, okay. That's what I thought. So it's um, a recommendation to move forward with the near-term and long-term recommendations concurrently. Without consideration of funding, as I understood, the near term and long term would be subject to potentially different funding mechanisms that have different constraints that should not be overlooked um, in terms of the rate payers, but also the bonding issuance and interest rates and stuff. Again, wait for money. Yeah. Okay, so before we vote, any other comments, Renee? No. Tom, any other comments? Sorry, I'm having a hard time with the mic here. Um, no, so I, I mean, I guess I, I just kind of worry a little bit about um, the way that that's framed. I suppose. I mean, I'm I'm willing to consider the motion as as um, as said. I guess I I just I just worry. I mean, I just like we learned perhaps with the Nelson Flanders expansion that I mean the the, the long term is so far out there, right? And of course we have to start planning for that today. Um, but I don't know that. Um, I'm not sure that planning is maybe maybe the way that it's being framed. I'm not sure that 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 how these things are working necessarily in parallel. I guess I I could just kind of maybe I'm trying to kind of separate these into two separate pieces. I guess a, a little bit more than 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 you all are. And um, so kind of giving a recommendation to kind of like okay, let's let's try to get going is as quickly as, as possible on the near term type project and of course starting the regular planning that, uh, that, uh, that a city always does I, I'd say just like this project is kind of associated with um, over the long term but I'm not sure that those things are quite as connected in my mind I suppose as maybe they they were presented there but like I said I'm I'm willing to vote on the proposal as as set so okay all right so there's a oh, there's a what was that? Oh, all right. So a motion was made and seconded. All in favor? Signify by saying aye. 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 Aye from Tom. Aye from me. Here it is. We'll do the details. <laughs> no, that was some, some good information. Thank well, you for, well put together. Yeah, thanks for listening. Okay. You can, you can stick around if you want. But if you want to go, you can sure go. Yeah. Thank you. We'll be Thank more you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Any agenda revisions? I have none. Okay. Wes, we're on the development activity. So just one item, the packet for consideration takes action. That's Summer, or sorry, Shore Station final plat. It's a 
23.86 acre parcel located north of Highway 119 and south of Sugar Hill Road. East of, uh, and so it's right about that triangle where Third Avenue comes into Kim Pat Boulevard. Uh, the historic water rights, including three shares of Denial and Taylor, were transferred to time annexation. Full 23.86 acres are subject to the full requirements of the raw water requirement policy. And the total raw water deficit for Sugar Mill Station final plot is 69.456 acre feet. And so, therefore, Sugar Mill Station final plot would be in compliance with the city's raw water requirement policy upon satisfaction of the 69. Point four five six acre foot deficit at time of plot approval. So there, what's being proposed here is approximately three hundred and thirty multifamily units, one, two, and three bedroom units, um, five buildings. And there's a commercial piece and a kind of a detention open area. Can you? Oh, good. You just did. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. and so these would be, I think, I think they're hooked out as either three or four stories. Is there anything? And there is that that been annexed to the yes, city yet? That's correct. Anything around it been annexed to the city? Yes, it has. That's all right. the whole thing? Yeah. Okay. I can describe what's being built there. Excuse me? What what's so going putting, on? They're gonna put in essentially four or five multifamily units. Kind of like what you would see if you're sitting there today and looking across the street to the south. Okay. And it's multifamily, not mixed use? It's a uh, designation is multi-use zoning, but they're doing a uh, multi-family, 330 multi-family units. Okay, just curious. Yeah. What's the commercial unit you said? Excuse me? The commercial unit you said. Yeah, there's one lot that they've left out. I think they've left it as some kind of commercial. I don't know the details of that though. Okay. Hey, can you hear us? Yeah. Uh, so I, I was just, I mean, the thing that just uh, kind of popped off the page of me when I was reviewing this over the weekend was just the size, right, of the deficit. I mean, it's, it's. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know exactly, but you could probably add up a lot of the things that we've considered over the last, let's say, six or almost 12 months, and it probably doesn't add up to the, to the size of the deficit in this case. I don't know, I mean, it, I don't know that I have a question or comment even, it's just, maybe the question is, is does that, that meaningful at all like in other words like um i don't know does it I, does all of this kind of scale correctly so in other words like um if the sizes are bigger it, it just means that they're paying more money of course but it, that, that there's no onerous kind of uh, something more onerous for the you know, for, for the uh for the city in, in that case yeah yeah like you yeah, know like, it really shows how uh, variable annexes are to, and specific to their own annexation. So the piece immediately to the east of this, the little small little piece that's not shown here, that has the full three acre foot per acre already satisfied. So you develop that site, there are no further raw water deficits. But on that one, just theoretically across the, across the road, you have near a full three acre foot per acre. And it's all dependent upon the historical water rights that were pertinent to time annexation. And this that one just didn't have any, hardly any, just that those three units of, or shares of Deny on Taylor. And so that's, it's, this is not uncommon as to why so many areas, this is a part of the reason why so many areas that have been annexed and not yet been platted within Longmont are that way. Is developers come in and they don't really understand that not each parcel is created equal in terms of what's remaining in their raw water deficit. And so when you do the math or, but it is what it is. You know, I think the thing common is, in my mind is we've got to be consistent with what we do. I mean, nobody will understand us if we don't. And it looks like a big, a big deal. But uh, as long as we're consistent in what we do, I agree. Yeah, but a thousand percent, I agree with that. I mean, we, we of course need to be consistent across the board. I was just kind of curious about whether, whether there was any. Anything special about you know as you scale up to larger kind of deficits, but uh, of course there's there's not. It doesn't sound like, and I, I kind of knew that going into this, but but it just uh, it was worthy of questions. Okay. 
Any other comments? Is there a motion? I'll make a motion, Mr. Chair, that um, we approve staff's recommendation that the Sugar Mill Station final flat would be in compliance with the city's well water requirement policy on satisfaction of the 69.456 acre feet deficit at final, final flat pool. I would second. Okay. Yeah. Move and second. Then. Let's vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Looks like unanimous. Thanks, Wes. You're on to the next item, aren't you? Yeah. So the next item in front of you is the cash and lieu. Um, as you know, we board the views cash and lieu quarterly. Um, the last one would have been in March. Um, we'll be re you'll be reviewing it again in June. As of uh, right now, to remind everyone, um, current cash and lieu fee is $48,500 per acre foot. That was set back in March of 2022. Um, and there's two parts really that comprise of that. The, the, the original Winnie Gap diversion and pumping project, which is about $30,000 of that. And then the uh, city's current investment in the Winnie Gap farming project, which is about $18,500. And so um, we were optimistic that we were going to have some additional information to be able to give to you for this uh, review. We haven't yet received it. Those are some stuff regarding the federal permit lawsuit settlement and the Colorado River connectivity channel costs. Those are a couple things that the northern staff is working on. Um, there's also, when we do a big project like this, you build in a contingency to pay for unexpected changes. Um, and those have been rolling in, and that'll also probably, we'll be providing you some information in June about that. Some of those um, contingency costs have been pretty large. We expected that, but they might be um, beginning to be where they're maybe greater than what we originally anticipated. So at this time, we really don't have a recommendation to make a change because we have no data to really support a change. But we do believe that uh, a change in Windy Gap project cost estimates will most likely uh, be prudent at the June water board cash in review. I got a quick question a paragraph that I'll just read it. Staff's not received updated construction costs for Chimney Howell. Some of the information is being released and we'll update current information at that time. As soon as full cost information becomes available, staff will forward the information to water board for consideration. Any further adjustments to cash and move. So as far as the timing on when Chimney Hollow might start being a player in our cash and blue calculations, is that long down the road or is it near term or I'm trying to understand when we're going to be impacted by Chimney Hollow? <clears throat> so timing wise, we'll know, or we know now about the federal lawsuit costs as each month month goes on, additional costs for the project. Um, we'll know fairly accurately by the June you know, the cash in the setting on what some of the current um, costs are and where the project's at. Um, the most accurate information is going to come in August. Um, we'll be about halfway through the project. We're actually almost halfway through now. By August, the project will be about halfway done. There's, there's going to be a, a harder look at the dollars and, and better information on what any of the expected cost increases might be. Um, so it really could either be June or the September, either the June or the September cash in those settings. You know, it's, um, for um, a cash in lieu, it's not going to be. A huge change. Uh, it's not going to be like when we were from 18 to 48. Uh, you know, it, it's going to go from 48 to 50 or 50. Yeah. Um, and we'll want to look at you know, cost, cost of living increases, some of those things. Um, but, you know, right now we know um, what we know about the project is that if you, if the 
the current contingency from a construction standpoint has not been exceeded. Um, it's on time and on budget. However, when you add in the federal lawsuit costs, um, we are, are now uh, project, projecting that the final project cost will exceed the contingency. Now, um, there's original project cost just to me all the construction costs are there. 480 million. The it was a 10 percent contingency, so there's about 48 million dollars um, available for contingency throughout the entire project. Um, right now we're in around I can you tell you around 30 or so million. Um, but when we add on the, the federal lawsuit cost, just the increased construction cost. With the contract that was 22 million for the lawsuit. When you add that on, we're just a little over, we're in the low 50s, 51, 52, 53 million. So we know there's a, a little bit of money there that's going to have to come in. Um, and that's really why there's sufficient funding clear up until 20, right now, uh, until 2025. So there, there are any additional funding requests would come in. Probably late 24, so we've got to sit there available for 2025. Okay. Um, but um, the best numbers are coming in uh, August. Okay. But it's just, it's not a huge amount, but it certainly will. I think we'll want to look at it in June uh, and September at the latest. Um, we'll probably want to look at doing that. You know, we'll have to see how this is cost increased or not. Really, not anything there. And and again, then we'll have to make the decision. Do we want to set the cash in June, or do we want to wait until we actually pay that money a year down the road? Uh, so we'll be able to have that right. thought too. So, um, yes. Um, actually, and then also, um, and I don't mind, <laughs> uh, Planning Power Authority is putting a few more units. Uh, they're windy gap water on the market. Um, so right now, the last, based upon uh, what windy gap has been going for us, for the 30,000 of the 48,000 is that number. Um, Mid-ish this year to probably more like next fall, we'll actually do that sale. And so we'll, we'll know that as well. Okay. And I personally expect that to be right. the value of that um, based upon what the market say? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, so that's really where we are right now. All right. Yeah. Any other comments about cash and move from the board? It, uh, it's a position we're just going to leave the project cash and move where it is, so we'll just uh, move on from there. So, thanks. Thank you. You're still on, Wes. <laughs> So uh, the next item before you is the uh, city's 2023-2024 water supply and water shortage implementation plan. Um, so in the past, we've kind of commonly referred to it as a water supply and drought management plan, but the drought seems to have not, it's kind of a negative connotation, but really what we're talking about is what are we going to do when we don't when you have periods that there's a water shortage. So that's why it's, we felt better to kind of rephrase that. But I'll remind everyone, the purpose of the plan is just to manage the city's water supplies and to uh, anticipate, identify, and respond to water shortage in the St. Rain Creek watershed. Um, this plan evaluates the impacts on the raw water availability for the city of Longmont and recommends uh, responses to the current water supply and demand forecast. And it also formalizes the city's planning for future water shortages. So we're currently at a sustainable conservation level. We, for the most part, have been there for quite some time. And um, we've been there largely because of conservation efforts of the uh, Longmont citizens. Um, our our water supply shortage or drought plan is really based upon the raw water master plan. So we use a one in a hundred year time period. Other municipalities will use something shorter. 
I don't know anybody that used greater than a one in a hundred year um, time period. And then we also have it over a seven year duration. Some municipalities will have it over a three year period, some of them even less than that. So we're very conservative in our plan. Uh, we take a, a look at kind of a, a more worst case scenario compared to others and over a longer period of time. So um, in, in doing that, um, we noted that last year, um, everything was pretty average. Um, from average snowpack, average rainfall, um, average runoff. We finished uh, last irrigation season with pretty much average storage at 68%. Um, our current projections are that by the middle of July, our select reservoirs will be 90% of full. And the select reservoirs we're talking about are those that we could use for a municipal supply. It's like Bud Rock, Union, Birch, McCall, McIntosh, Clover Basin, Pleasant Valley, kind of those. We're thinking they're probably going to nearly fill, and that's, that's real consistent with what's been in years past. Um, when we look at the actual water data, Looking at last year, uh, total water supply available was 24,498 feet. Uh, this year, just have, we're expecting just slightly more, 24,756 acre feet. Last year's uh, water treatment demand was 17,181 acre feet. And we're predicting a demand of about 17,525. Snowpack today, um, I believe for the South Platte, was right at 100%. And the Colorado River was at 128%. Um, interestingly, the St. Green Basin was at 117%. So what we're kind of finding is those basins north of us are a little bit stronger. Those that are south of us, a little bit drier. And when you look at the South Platte and you add all those together, that's why we're right now at about 100%. But St. Green Basin itself is showing Slightly better than average at 117 percent. That was as of today. What, were we last year? Were we at 100 percent, or were we a little less than 100 percent? Last year at this time, we were we were very close to 100. I think we might have been 98 or so. I mean, we were really close. This is a little better than we were last year. This is better than we were last year. That's correct. So um, the next thing we kind of look for in this plan is the description of indicators and trying to decide. What are the some of the looking at some of the triggers to determine what the most respo uh, um, accurate response level would be? So we're looking at things such as the Natural Resource Conservation Service monthly stream flow forecast. They put that out starting in April. We'll do the last one in May. So we've got one more month. Um, comes out at the first of each month. It's that document that really guides what our yields are going to be on our uh, direct flow supplies because our, so our decrees reference what their, if it's going to be a wet average or dry condition, then that then determines how much we're going to be able to use in a given month or a given day. But it just so happens you, that range is like 60% to 140% is average. And so therefore, it's almost always average. And it is this year, and that's why. So that's the first thing we look at is what the uh, at NRCS is stream flow forecast, and they're saying it's average, and we put those numbers in accordingly. The next thing we're looking at is the NRCS's monthly snowpack. We kind of just talked about that. We're checking that each day. It's everything for us for the most part is right at average or slightly above average. The uh, same next is the St. Rain Creek Basin Reservoir storage levels. And uh, currently, Butt Rock is, about, I think Kevin might have mentioned, it's about 68%. Uh, or, I'm sorry, all of our reservoirs right now are around 68%. Butt Rock's at about 87% full. And uh, so it's down about 2,100 ish acre feet. Union's down about 3,500 acre feet. But um, that's not surprising to us. Butt Rock is actually fuller than we would have normally expected going into it and unions down a little bit more but uh, that's we're feeling really good about that the trans mountain water supplies um, last week the northern board issued an additional 30 percent supplemental quota to bring the total quota declaration to 70 percent so when we look at um, our cbt quota 
that which they just said last week. The upper ball one, ditch replacement water, carryover, CBT exchanges, and windy gap supplies. The, to the sum total of our Trans Mason water supplies is uh, estimated to be 17,585 acre feet. So a big chunk of what uh, of our water available comes from CBT supplies. So, and then again, that's very, that's 70%. That's what the quota was last year. Um, we look at the raw water availability for the city of Longmont. So, um, as well as treatment water demands and the, uh, and kind of looking at it in a multi-year. So we're looking at not just uh, this year, we're really trying to stay, pay special focus for next year and the following year. So in other words, we're really not, don't take this out of context, we're not worried about this year. We're trying to make sure we have enough water for sure for the next three years, and that's what this plan looks at. And so our treated water demands, I mentioned earlier, we were expecting this year to be about 17,500. Um, uh, we're anticipating about a two or two and a half percent increase in the next couple of years for water treatment demand. Um, it's surprising though, um, again, you know, hats off to the citizens of Longmont for water conservation efforts. Our total demand has not increased a whole lot in 20 years, even though our population has increased. And so um, we think that's an accurate representation of what the demands might go be the next couple of years. And, um, and so when you look at all those, when you look at it comparing supply to demand, that's really what all this boils down to. Um, kind of kind of just jump uh, we, we can talk about some of these uh, other descriptions we'll go back to it no problem but I'm going to go ahead and jump to the graph because I think that's that's there's two graphs that were included in here is exhibit A and B and uh, it's on page 31 and 32 and um, and so what what we were really wanting to show on that is that our supply to our demand for this year, although it doesn't show up exactly, is calculated to be about 141%. For next year, it's calculated to be about 140%, and the following year, 137%. So if you just, if, if nothing else, if you just remember those percentages, kind of the trigger level comes at about 135%. So if we were estimating our supply to be 112%, then that would say, hey, we, we really need to look at something other than a sustainable conservation level. But so long as those numbers are 135% or greater, it then says we should be at a sustainable conservation level, and that's what they do. And that, so that kind of, I think, all makes sense given our snowpack and our CBT supplies and our storage and so forth. But the, the second indicator is more, a little more specific, and it would be the following graph. And it would look at the water storage supply indicator and really what we're looking there for is more specifically at Ralph Price Reservoir because that's the source that's feeding Nelson Flanders for water and so the uh, criteria there is that we would be at something greater than 85 percent of, uh, of, of its capacity on July 15th and the reason we use July 15th is that's after the runoff season. So right now, as we said today, we're already above that's that threshold, and we fully expect Button Rock to fill by July 15th of this year. So when you look at those two indicators, which are the primary indicators to determine what level we should be at, both of them suggest remaining at a sustainable conservation level. And so that's really the heart of the of the plan. We we try to with the help of, of Hope especially, we tried to come up with a little better table that might help uh, the, the consumers, the, our, our customers, the citizens of Longmont, of what, um, what we're looking for in terms of a sustainable conservation level, most of which speak to best management practices. And so, as you may recall in prior uh, plans, we kind of had a lot of text in there about these things. And it was rather dry. It was it was kind of 
hard to read. And so we tried to make an attempt to kind of show what that is. It really probably becomes more important to get to what would be considered mild, or moderate, or severe drought, some of those uh, things. But um, there's nothing to indicate that we're going to go, uh, go there. And if you just could jump just a couple more pages uh, into it, go to page 23. Um, there is, as one example of best management practice at a sustainable conservation level, of kind of some, some watering. Um, we've been sitting in on um, uh, meetings with other, air, other representatives up and down the uh, front range, trying to get a more common message out. Is that's, that's, been, that's been hard because, again, not every other water provider uses the same criteria to determine what response they should be in. But I think this is an example maybe of just lawn watering, how one might um, water three days a week, and how you might implement that. So this is under sustainable conservation. So we're trying to make it a little better. Um, I think I'll be the first to admit, I think we've still got a little bit more that we can work on on this, but I think the, the main message I wanted to get across is that we're uh, the data suggests that we would remain in a sustainable conservation model. So with that, I'm, I think that's all I really have. I'm trying to answer some questions. But that, that demand is amazing, though. It really is. I, it's, it's hard to believe, but it really is. I assume the figures are correct, Wes. Absolutely. <laughs> and, they're, and they're typical. Um, you're talking about the flat demand for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Denver Water is that as well. Is that right? A lot of, a lot of utilities. Well, that's, that's surprisingly good news. Yeah, it's my favorite chart. Is the flat <laughs> <laughs> um, while the population is going up, and the kind of steady state for demand. That's wonderful. You know, when we looked at 2022, it was within like tens of acre feet when compared to the total amount in 2002. Yeah, it's just, yeah. it's just, you know, maybe some of that's everybody's. Using low flush toilets and maybe using better management practices on their lawn, but the reality of it is it's yeah. a little consistent. And widespread metering matters too. Yeah, that's a great point, right now. And and um, you know, uh, inclining block structure rates, they're considered a best management practice for yeah. conservation as well. Um, because they charge people more money the more you use, so it sends a signal to people who pay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's stay flat. Any other questions for Wes? Uh, um, I have a couple. Yeah, so uh, I was just going to mention that um, it, it's also pretty amazing in light of the fact that there's you know a third of our water profile, of course, that we can't reuse, right? That, that we can't even really engage in that other kind of water management strategy, like water reuse, because of the CBT you know piece of our profile, I suppose. So that that's that's another kind of interesting aspect of this. Um, I was just curious, actually, and this is more of an academic exercise, perhaps, but if that could exhibit A, is there a reason why, um, let's see, what, what page was that on? Yeah, there you go. Um, is there a reason why the, the, the demand dot kind of sticks so well with the severe drought kind of um, trace? I think what that's saying, what that really is, is like when I was talking about those percentages, the 135% being the kind of the the, uh, the threshold. And what we find is, so when you go into a water year, on a given day, you have a certain amount of water available to you. And on a given day, like let's just say in June, you, may have more water available to you than you actually need, okay? So maybe it, maybe it rained, and our decrees allow us a certain amount of water available to us to use on that day. But once that day is over, you had to use a certain amount to satisfy it, but the, el the, the remainder kind of proverbially goes down the river. And so um, what happens is that the the amount that's used and the amount that's left over tends to kind of fall pretty close to that hundred and 
35 to 145% time frame. And so, it, 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 in other words, maybe at the beginning of the year, it's, there's a whole lot more of, it's kind of a little wider, but when it gets down to the very end, when it's all over, it's pretty close. And so that's kind of a, it's kind of a reason why these kind of fall kind of close. That's probably one of the primary reasons. It's kind of like they're, they're based on some, some kind of similar metrics or something. Yeah, yeah also. Could it be just the curtailment? Like you can't get more grants? You can't demand more than available? Yeah, I think that that's, that would be, that would probably be true as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions for Wes? I guess you're looking for our approval of staying on the sustainability level. So, somebody want to make a motion to position? I move to approve the sustainability and drought management plan. It's a call to fishery storage plan. <laughs> it's a it's a mouthful. I know. And asking for a recommendation to council. And a rec so we'll recommend it to approval. council for approval. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thanks, Wes. Thank you. And Roger, um, we've got all the items from staff next. I just want to do a quick time check with um, the board. If we, we have a couple of these things we could truck here or we'll come back with next month, or we can just keep plugging through whatever the board's favor is. Uh, what overburden you today? <laughs> so be, be more specific as far as what you could come back to. Um, the annual button up reserve update. What would you say, Miles? That's probably we could have ten. Yeah, minutes. I mean, yeah, 10 15 minutes probably, but yeah, and the other three are pretty short. <laughs> and uh, we'll also, under line from board, we need to talk about the recruitment interviews. So, yeah, yeah, um, so, I just don't want to keep you too late, <laughs> but. It's, it's up to the board. What's, what's everybody's feeling? Somebody got a five o'clock deadline or? Okay, sounds like we're gonna run short of time, so. Okay. Um, Truncation is one, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Miles. No, <laughs> 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 we'll bring that next month. And then we'll let the tape on. Put that up so Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And I really kind of talk, the one thing I'm going to be to talk about was the, the costs and coming back. So I think that we, we will try to say that. And, uh, and I did want to talk real quickly um, in your packet, we included uh, raw water uh, tours, and actually quite a few this year. Um, um, one of them I wanted to point out was there's, there's two tour dates for the Chimney Hollow Reservoir project. And that's Longmont only. Um, it's the whole tour will be reserved for Longmont, so um, in, in the board can go to both of them one. But um, that's, we, we will invite council. Uh, They're the same members. tour, are they not? Um, it'll be the uh, same tour other than a little more construction done yeah. in August. Than yeah. June, but, yeah. So there's a whole bunch of tours there. Just let us know any of those tours you want to go on. Hello. Okay. All right. So, um, as far as the annual water board report, how do you want to handle that, Ken? Um, we have included it in your packet uh, most years. We provide our information. Yeah. Well, for your information, actually, this is. A requirement to go it goes to it's a report that water board is giving city council um, and uh, it goes every year to council so really what we do is we prepare for you and then if there's any additions corrections uh, to the report um, let us know if not we'll plan on submitting the report to council pretty comprehensive I thought you guys did a nice job. Yeah. 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 I was also gonna. I was also gonna say that um, that uh, I've only seen two of these so far because I started in a July of, of 21. So you must have had a report read before I started. But I always like this time of year because it helps to kind of reflect a little bit on 
what we've been up to for the last year, and I thought it was really comprehensive, and I thought, um, uh, I just, you know, so appreciate the effort that goes into it, and so, yeah, thanks to staff for that. It was helpful, too. It was somebody who wasn't here last year to kind of skim through and be like, uh-huh. <laughs> well, I guess we're saying the report's fine with us and okay. uh, moving Good. forward and good job. Okay, board and commission recruitment interviews. Um, let me just check with Heather, maybe you know. I, I called to see how many people are interested in position yep. for a position and evidently with because we're losing our Allison here will probably have two positions open because mine expires. We have three applicants. Three applicants. Okay. Right. Should so, be able to fill. <laughs> so I would assume let me just ask this for starters. Um, as far as interviewing the applicants, uh, I guess we all know that we all got involved in the thing by our desire. Do uh, you want to do the same thing? Yeah, Anybody? You, you want to be part, part of the interview? Tom? Do you, you want to be part of that process? Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, yeah, I would, I would like to be. Okay, well, let's plan on us doing that. Now, my thought is, why don't, can we set up the Emory interviews up prior to our next board meeting? And we can just flow into it. And uh, now this is really interesting because You're have I'm to not. I'm, I'm not. Yourself from interviewing. Yeah, yeah. Which does anybody want to interview me that day? <laughs> <laughs> so are we interviewing for two positions then? Yeah, yeah. for two positions yeah. that day. Mm -hmm. So yeah. make sure that that was all concurrent at the same time. Yeah. yeah. So it's not fill a vacancy and then you want to just go this up. Yeah. yeah. So. Right. So okay. So you're. Uh, so it's made are, you, to be the time. are you going to be yeah. part of the yeah. process, or what's your situation? I'm going to be starting day one. So if it's in just before we would. Yeah. It's not part of the you're not going to be part of the process. Okay. So anyway, will you kind of put that together for yep. me, Roger? Mm -hmm. I think we look forward to interviewing Roger, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got to ask some special hard questions. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Yeah, that'll be three of us yeah, interviewing be three of us Roger and four of us interviewing two others. Well, should Roger no. review the other oh, questions? No, I don't. I, so three of us. I think I'm out. Three of us. Three of us. Three of us. But as, as, as we did it, uh, we had a batch of questions that mm -hmm. yes. and, and then super helpful i don't know how you want to do it with me not being there but i thought it worked pretty good we just kind of picked down the order and each of us asked a question go around the horn that way how did you feel that interview was renee um it was actually kind of nice because it gave a chance like there have been times where previously i was on waterboard and somebody new would show up and be like cool who are you <laughs> <laughs> um, and so i could see from y'all's perspective that it'd be you know you know who I was, so it did. Yeah. Um, and because we had some back and forth, it was also a chance for me to get to know some of the new ones. Yeah. So. Now, Marcy, you guys decide in June, do you not? Yes. So we'll be done with moving our stuff right. on to you by then. And you really are supposed to um, recommend, you know, I mean, suppose something happened in the next three days and you had nine applicants, still refer the best two or three that you've got two seats. You know, you, you may want to leave some leeway um, for the council to make a decision, or you don't even have to. You know, if, if one of them are in doubt in terms of their ability to accept the position, then just refer it to you. Well, the process that we used for the first time went on. Did that work out for you guys pretty good? Yes, it, yeah. it did. It, some of the some of the boards didn't do that and still did still refer to everybody anyway so the council didn't like get the free ride we were expecting <laughs> but, um, but that's still the plan yes. yeah i think it's a good plan so let me let me see if i heard you correctly so you'd be happy if we managed to screen so yes. that there's less for you to get through yes it. that's the whole idea is that you guys are better judges of a good water board member than the council is and the council's interviews are 
um, you know, when every when every applicant was getting interviewed by the council, they were so short that it was almost an insult. And I'm guessing a chunk of your time as well. And it took all day. Yeah, yeah, it took all day. Okay, so we've got three applicants. Let's say that stays the same. Yeah. Do you want from this group? Board to rate them or just move two of them on to your ideally move two of them on. Okay. If, if there's you know if there's some reason to move all three on, then we may. Um don't move again, don't move more than one's no, there. If we move two on and there's two openings of this, it should be pretty easy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any questions on this topic at all? Should work out pretty good. Well, I guess I have one, Marche is since there's two positions and they have different terms, right? One is the completion of Allison's term. Mm -hmm. You don't need us to tell you which slot should be for the candidate. I mean, that's no, but you may. Okay. And I don't know what happens. <coughs> I just wonder, you know, because one's going to be a five-year position, one's going to be a two and a half. Two and a half. Two and a half different positions. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, Presuppose any. Yeah. Um. Okay, well, the last thing is major projects listings. Uh, any, we all looked that over. Any comments or additions to what's being proposed or yeah, going down the road? Anybody, everybody happy with it? I guess no comment. Just the answer is yes, we're happy with it. You know, I have one thing, Ken, that Maybe it's just me that has the issue with it. I'd, I'd like to better understand how we use Union Reservoir as a supply. Okay. For a, I mean, if somebody could just take a little time at one meeting and just explain that a little better. I don't know if I'm the only one that has that problem, but I don't, I don't quite understand how we do that. You know, that's a really good subject because every now and then it's great to be able to, because the public will be able to see this to get that information out. Because that's probably one of the questions I get more than a lot of the questions yeah. on water supply. Yeah. People wanting to know, why do you have the reservoir east of town? How does that help you? So yeah, that's, that's okay. great. Great, great. Yeah. A lot of dog walkers are bringing it up. Well, my dog can poop in Union Reservoir. Why can't you keep the dog in? <laughs> <laughs> now, you haven't you haven't signed off on that button rock no dog policy have you yet? Well, uh, yeah, it's on second reading on the twenty fourth. So, but but I think we are all adamant that we don't want to drink poopy water. So, <laughs> did you, it didn't sound like you got much pushback. Well, you know what, we did get a lot of pushback uh, on the night of the presentation, um, and then and then. Uh, a bunch of people realized, oh, wait a minute, you're taking something away from me. And so then, <laughs> then a, 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 since then, uh, you know, the night of the first reading, and I've got quite a few letters, and so there, yeah, there may be a bunch of people speaking against it. Um, well, prove that there's contaminants in the water. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that's about all the items we have. Sorry for putting oh, some of you people that's off. That's fine. <laughs> that's perfectly fine. Hope oh, you got anything? Nope. Nope. I know it's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you can make up for it another oh, time. Oh yeah, next month. Okay. Hour. Right, a quick one. Um, Heather, because we had the opportunity to tell you that we're interested in chores, but there'll be two potentially new members, perhaps not, perhaps old members. Perhaps the attorney member. Anyways, <laughs> but do we save spots on tours for people that might be new to the board? Because I think that's the most useful way to get to know the system. I mean, the tour that we took, we came on was fabulous. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's a placeholder you can put in for there for somebody. Rock, for our uh, raw water Certainly for tours, ours. we definitely yeah. do that. Okay, cool. Yeah. Because I think the timing actually works out pretty good on that if they're available on June 9th if we get that done in May. So, or it actually won't be because it'll be the end of. June is it that you all? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it won't work. Yeah. I just think that was really helpful for 
Mm -hmm. Oscar right now is busy. But I know. Yeah, yeah, so nice. Well, we'll know what ones you're recommending to council and so. Well, 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 up to you guys, but I just figured that was an opportunity. I didn't want to. That's a good point. Do I have anything else before we adjourn? Uh, no, I just I just wanted to say thanks for accommodating uh, me. I'm, we have uh, exit um, exams uh, this week for our graduate students, and um, we had a bumper crop of students that are graduating, and so it was just there were a lot of them, and uh, and I was able to preserve the time around this meeting, except for I didn't. Uh, I wasn't able to preserve enough time to drive up to the meeting, so I appreciate uh, accommodating you remotely. So thank you. I won't make a habit of this, but um, it just happened this time. So see you next month. See you next month. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Anybody else before we adjourn? We're adjourned. Bye, Tom.